If you think for a moment about the way mammals reproduce, you'll realize that the placenta is actually where the rubber really meets the road. That is the place where the fetus is interacting with the mother and where fetal nourishment and gas exchange is taking place. An interesting feature of placentas is that in many mammals they are invasive and that has consequences. When the embryo implants, it actually aggressively attacks the endometrial tissue. It invades it and this pattern is very old. The degree of invasiveness varies among mammalian groups. Invasion is something that should give the fetus an advantage early in life and it would do that by giving the embryo increased control over nutrition and therefore growth. But there's a trade-off. There is an association between the degree of placental invasion and the risk of preeclampsia and metastatic cancer. Preeclampsia is abnormally high blood pressure, life-threateningly high blood pressure during pregnancy. And of course, metastatic cancer is a problem in aging uh, in many systems. The properties of invasive stem cells are actually very similar to the properties of metastatic cancer cells. In other words, the idea here is it was a great idea from the point of view of the embryo to develop an invasive stem cell so that it could take control of growth and nutrition. But in so doing, it created something that would hang around in the body and then years later be pre-adapted to become a metastatic cancer cell. So the pre-embryo implants aggressively. The outer embryonic cells are called the trophoblasts and they bore into the uterus by secreting enzymes that dissolve tissue and that allows them access to maternal blood vessels. The endometrium which is produced by the mother both enables this but it also resists it and limits the invasion. The trophoblast that's coming from the embryo becomes part of the placenta and there those cells secrete hormones that mimic maternal hormones. Those hormones influence maternal blood sugar and the dilation of the maternal arteries in the placenta helping to regulate delivery of nutrients. So one of the ways for the baby to get more nutrient out of the mother is to increase the level of sugar in her blood and it can do that by regulating the level of insulin in her blood and if that regulation goes off then you get pregnancy related diabetes. For our purposes the features of placental morphology are the ones that determine how many layers of cells and tissue separate the fetal blood from the maternal blood and then how intimately intermingled are fetal and maternal tissue over how large a surface area. Prior to placenta formation, there are six layers of tissue separating the maternal and the fetal blood. During placentation, one, two, or three of the maternal layers can be lost. And the shape of the placenta can either be diffuse, meaning that it occupies most of the surface of the embryonic sac, it can be what is called cotyledonary with multiple discrete attachments, zonary, forming a band around the fetus, or discoid, attaching at one point and smaller than the fetus. Humans have discoid placentas, and they have placentas in which three layers of maternal tissue have been lost. So let's take a look at the fetal and the maternal layers. The fetal extraembryonic membranes all go into forming the placenta. That's the endothelium that lines the allantoic capillaries, the connective tissue in what's called the chorioallantoic mesoderm, and the chorionic epithelium, the outermost layer from the trophoblast. So these are all part of the outer layers that are surrounding the embryo. The maternal tissues can be endothelium that lines the endometrial blood vessels, the connective tissue in the endometrium and the endometrial epithelial cells. So three layers of fetal tissue and three layers of maternal tissue. Now, if a veterinarian looks at this and makes classifications based on layers, what they see is this. If you look at how many maternal layers are retained, it can be one, two, or none, okay? And this would be three layers retained, one layer retained, and none retained. 
there are other organisms where you have the other possible combinations. The type of placenta is then called epitheliochorial if all three of the mother layers are retained. You find that in horses, pigs, and in cows. If you have just the endothelium of the mother retained, that's the situation in dogs and cats, that's called endotheliochorial. And hemochorial, that's the most invasive kind of placenta, where none of the maternal tissues are retained. All of them have been dissolved away by fetal enzymes, giving maximum access to maternal blood supply. That's what happens in humans and in rodents. So in humans and rodents, the growing villi, which are coming in from the fetus into the placenta, erode through the maternal endothelium. And in that hemochorial placenta, the fetal chorionic epithelium is bathed directly in maternal blood. So it's a way of gaining direct access to the maternal blood supply. Now, when and why did that evolve? And what are the consequences? The other major thing is the overall macro shape of the placenta. This is a diffuse placenta. It is all over the embryonic sac. A discoid placenta is just in one small part of the wall of the uterus. That's what the human placenta looks like. A cotyledonary placenta is formed all over the uterus but in little blotches. And a zonary placenta wraps like a ring around the growing fetus. So a diffuse placenta can be found in horses and pigs, a cotyledonary placenta in cattle and in sheep, a zonary placenta in things like dogs and cats, and a discoid placenta like this in humans, apes, monkeys, and rodents. The point is, that's being made here is that placentas vary a great deal among mammals and there is interesting information to be gathered about the sorts of evolutionary conflicts that are going on when you study both the macro and the micro morphology of placentas. So let's take a look at the evolutionary history of shape. We have a discoid placenta, okay? So this is human and this is human here. And here we have information on whether or not that is a discoid placenta or not. Black is discoid, okay? And what we see here on the phylogenetic tree is that black is an ancestral condition. It looks like the first eutherians had discoid placentas. The zonary placenta has evolved a few times. It's present in foxes and in cats and in things like elephants and rock hyraxes and aardvarks. Uh, the bidiscoid placenta is in tree shrews and the cotyledonary placenta is in cows. So the human condition is an ancient one. The discoid placenta is something that hasn't changed for 150 million years. What about whether it is folded or lamellar or villus or trabecular or so forth? Well, the human placenta is villus, and a villus placenta basically is one that penetrates into the, endo into the endometrium with villi, okay, finger-like projections that are invading that space. The villus condition is something that has happened in humans and other primates. It has also happened in cows and foxes and, and in cows and pangolins and tapirs and things like that, okay? So it is a derived condition. So the uterus is, the human uh, placenta is a mosaic of attributes that have different evolutionary ages. What about layers, okay? So here are the humans right here. Again, this has been moved over a little bit. This is a human right here. And what you see on this is the same phylogenetic tree, but there are different traits that are, that are plotted on it. The hemochorial placenta, that is the maximally invasive placenta, is in white. The epitheliochorial placenta, which is the least invasive placenta, is in black. 
and the endothelial is in green. The take home point here is that the invasive placenta is ancient. That hasn't changed for about 150 million years. So invasiveness is not derived in humans. There are other aspects of the placenta and of the interaction that are derived in humans, but that is not one of them. Now, what happens if there are fewer layers? So what happens as you go from hemochorial to endothelial chorial? Basically, the fewer layers of tissue there are between the mother and the fetus, the shorter the gestation period. Okay, so basically that is the difference between this line up here and this line down here. This is 109 species from all mammal orders. The data are log transformed. So this is how big the mom is. This is how long gestation is in log scale. The epithelial chorial is up here. It's non-invasive. And these are all of the relatively invasive types, intermediate to highly invasive. So it seems as though invasive embryos manage to shorten their gestation. This is about 35 days. Now, what did happen in humans and in chimpanzees and gorillas, but not in gibbons, was deep invasion and remodeling of the spiral arteries. Okay, so this is something that primary interstitial impl implantation is occurring only in, in great apes. It does occur in guinea pigs. Uh, that seems to be a rather different situation. In uh, humans, there are two routes of trophoblast invasion, and there is deep trophoblast invasion that reaches the inner third of the myometrium, part of the endometrium. This is shared only by great apes, okay? So this is something now that's, that's unique in humans and great apes. It is especially deep invasion. We now can take a look at the genes that are controlling that process, okay? So genes that are involved in the risk of preeclampsia and of trophoblast invasion experienced positive selection at two points. One was at the origin of the hominidae. That would be here. That's before the group of gibbons, orangutans, and gorillas, chimps, and humans. And the other is at the origin of the hominini. That is the smaller group that is just gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. At this point, we have hemochorial placentas that are discoid and villus, deep invasion, extensive spiral artery remodeling. In gibbons, they also have a hemochorial placenta, but invasion is shallow and there's very little remodeling of the spiral arteries. So we can look for signatures of selection in the genes that are controlling that shift. Out of 18,000 genes that were checked, for the synonymous non-synonymous ratio. This is a measure of uh, how many selective changes have taken place. 295 signaled positive selection on the branch going to the hominoidae. 264 positive selection on the branch leading to the hominini. So that's all genes. But these sets of genes were enriched for genes that function in the risk of preeclampsia and trophoblast invasion. So there is a correlation between risk of, of preeclampsia and how invasive the placenta is. Now, that is one potential trade-off. The other is between fetal nourishment and the risk of cancer. There are striking similarities between these invasive placental cells and invasive cancer cells. When these stem cells are invading the placenta, they are using capacity that is probably used by cancer cells to invade during metastasis. They have particular cell adhesion molecules. Their extracellular matrix and matrix metalloproteinases are of a particular sort. They are involved in angiogenesis, that is, in generating beds of arteries and veins and capillaries. And that is a feature of both implantation and the spread of cancer. 
So understanding the maternal mechanisms that control trophoblast invasion might be one route to understanding how to control metastases. Here is a list of genes, and I'm not going to go through them. Basically, what I want you to notice is that there are a lot of them. I'll talk a little bit about what kinds of things they're involved in. But these are genes that are expressed both in trophoblast and in metastases. So there are some smoking guns. Here is a case where we say if we want to upregulate stuff in a cell that will allow it to invade, those are the same things we would upregulate to allow it to become a metastasis. These have been found in colorectal cancer, breast cancer, testis cancer, lung cancer, kidney cancer, colon cancer, cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, leukemia, and so forth, liver cancer. So it's quite a battery of evidence that has started to accumulate that establish at the genetic level this connection between invasion and cancer. So to summarize, the mammalian placenta evolved in many different ways. They vary widely in tissue layers, separating fetal and maternal blood. They vary in the shape of structures that mediate exchange. And they vary in how much the fetal tissue invades the maternal tissue. Human placentas are a mix. They have some very ancient features and they have some derived features. Very deep invasion is derived. It is shared with chimpanzees and gorillas and is associated with preeclampsia, that is, dangerously high blood pressure during pregnancy. Trophoblast invasion preadapts cells for metastasis. It's an early life fitness benefit trading off with a late life risk. It is a classical case of antagonistic pleiotropy.